Welcome back to the Move Podcast. We're going to take a look at the first nine stages of the 2023 Giro d'Italia. Now, we already jumped in midweek and gave you, you know, a lot from stages one through six. Now we're going to go deeper into uh, everything that's happened since then, since we got together on Thursday, including a big abandon that none of us saw coming. That's a big deal. How does that change things? Why did it happen? And how are things going to shake out with those who remain? It really changes this entire Giro d'Italia. Before we get into that uh, and get have uh, Johan Bernil and Spencer Martin join us, before we do that, let's check in with Lance with some offers from a couple of our partners. Today's show also brought to you by Ventum. This is our bike, uh, our go-to bike of choice for not just myself, but George as well. Uh, we just got our new NS1s. We were just over in Europe. Uh, and, and, and have been just riding constantly on the new NS1. Thing's a damn rocket ship. Uh, of course, uh, the gravel bike, the GS1, is also a, a gravel rocket ship. Uh, it, it, it's been amazing. Uh, there's so many bikes and so many options out there. Uh, I got to say, this one uh, ha has really gotten my attention. And I finally converted the Diva, George, over to the Ventum. Uh, the brand is totally kicking ass. Uh, dedicated customer support to help you out at every step of the purchasing process. They're also producing great content. They'll make you inspired to ride your bike. We all need that. Check out their socials on Instagram and YouTube. It's at Ventum Racing. Special offer. Get 10% off when you use the code WEDO at checkout over at VentumRacing.com slash the move. Again, that's VentumRacing.com slash the move. Checkout code is WEDO. Gets you 10% off. And talk about being a fan of something. Let's talk about Manscaped. Let's go ahead and tell the world, right, that the leaders in below-the-waist grooming are traveling north of your South Pole with their revolutionary grooming products. The brand-new Weed Whacker 2.0 and their new Beard Blind confirms they have all the best tools for your hygiene toolbox. Time for you to upgrade your game by going to manscaped.com. Using the code THEMOVE gets you 20% off. Uh, but gentlemen... While you're there, check out the Beard Hedger Pro Kit. This is one, that we, you know, I can barely grow a beard, so you know George is all about this. A couple of other cool factoids. Waterproof, cordless trimmer, rotary wheel, 20 hair cutting links, all with one guard. An amazing thing. Also, and, and, and big thanks to, to everybody at Manscaped for, uh, for really pitching in for the fight against cancer, specifically the fight against testicular cancer. Um, good on you. Um, again, head on over to manscaped.com. Use the code the move that gets you 20% off and free shipping manscaped.com. All right. I am so glad that we have Johan Bernil and Spencer Martin in, in here to make some sense of this Giro d'Italia. I, I feel like we should start with the abandoned news. You know, Remco Evanpool had this seemingly in the bag, especially after watching that first opening time trial. And then it's like, is he slipping? The dialogue was like, is he slipping? Did, is he, did he in, on, on form too early? Is Roglic coming into form? And then we see an Aos becoming a real factor in this Giro d'Italia. So first, let's start with talking about Remco abandoning with COVID, which my, I'm trying to remember exactly our, our conversation on the preview show, but we didn't think COVID was going to be a factor at all mm. in this Giro d'Italia. Well... You know, it, um, yes and no, JB, because let's not forget, you know, Jumbo Visma had to reshake their whole team, basically. they I think from the initial eight names, uh, only three of them were at the start because they had COVID cases before the Giro. Uh, they had three guys from Romandia and another guy got, uh, got COVID and then, yeah, Trapnik crashed out uh, while he was already in Italy. So obviously we knew that COVID was in the peloton. Uh, especially, especially coming from Romandia, but uh, but yeah, I mean nobody saw this coming. Of course, uh, I've seen that Sudal Quickstep was really, really, really very careful. Uh, all the guys were wearing masks, and but you know what? Once you get into the race, things start to relax a little bit. And uh, I was also I was really surprised to see that news yesterday. Um, I, it was actually while while I was recording La Movida, so we were Victor Hugo, Peña, and I. We were talking about, you know, that Remco had won the time trial, but not with a huge difference. You know what did what did that mean? And then finally, during the during the podcast, we got the news that he uh, he had COVID. Um, 
obviously, I think that changes everything. Uh, um, we don't know if, um, of course, we we all saw how strong he was in the in the first first stage in the time trial. There, he took forty three seconds on what we thought would be his biggest rival. Because let's be honest, you know, we were not thinking or talking about Geraint Thomas and Theo Gegenhardt then. Um, and uh, and then he had that uh, crash, uh, two crashes, I think, on stage five or six. Um, and then we were waiting, okay, you know, how is he going to recover from this? Uh, and we saw that, uh, not yesterday, the day before, uh, he could not respond to an attack of Roglic. So... My thinking was, okay, you know, he is definitely still hurting a little bit from from the crash. Um, it was steep, uh, very steep. So it might, you know, hinder him a little bit. And then yesterday, the time trial was uh, a surprise. Even if he won it, he won the time trial um, with nine one hundredths of a second. Uh, but for me, more telling was the way his time trial went because he started off uh, and he said after the after the time trial, he had a really good pacing schedule. He knew how many watts he had to put out in this part, this part of the time trial, in this part. And he said that the first 13 kilometers, he was on schedule. He did what he was supposed to do. Uh, and then he saw that he could not maintain it. Uh, let's not forget, he was 20 seconds ahead of everybody um, on the on the first time split. And then he started to kind of to kind of fade away. Um, anyway, he still won the time trial by nine one hundredths of a second, which is, which is really, I mean, as like we said in the pre-show, Spencer, um, I think, uh, I, I've never, uh, yeah, I've never seen a time trial with such a small difference. Um, but yeah, I mean, listen, it's, it's, I think it's a big blow for the, for the Giro, of course, for cycling, uh, and even the guys who were there. Uh, in the names of Roglic and, and Geraint Thomas and Theo Gegenhardt and others who may have an option to win or be on the podium, I'm pretty sure that they would prefer that the the favorite of before the race is there and then beat him rather than you know winning and having the the the, the knowledge that yeah okay I won but you know. But anyway, it happens all the time in big stage races. You know, people crash out and there's always a winner. And at the end of the day. You know, that guy that wins the three-week stage race stays in the record books. Yeah, you never remember the rider who didn't win. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> stupid, but no one, like, I don't know, like the 91 NBA Finals, no one's like, well, Magic Johnson got hurt, and so Michael Jordan's title doesn't count. Like, you just, you slowly <laughs> forget that over time, and... You, you have Garen Thomas. Garen Thomas wins this. Uh, he'll probably <laughs> not be uh, beating himself up that Remco Evans will have a leap with COVID. No, th those, these are all factors in winning. Is it staying healthy, staying out of crashes? There, it's all those little bits and pieces that have to come together. Yeah, as part of racing. Yeah, but you know, I mean, I have to say though, you know, with with the COVID uh, present again, and you know, and and. and Evan Poole is not the first guy. I think there's like three or four guys. One of them was Filippo Gana. Another guy is Rigoberto Guran. I think there's two or three others who went home. Um, it's, it's you know, we're going to wake up every day and see who is starting the stage. Because now that it's it's going around, you know, I mean, it's it, I, I know for a fact, for example, that Sudal Quickstep and Ineos and Jumbo Visma are teams that are really, really very, very careful. They th they think about everything. I mean, it would be, you know, stupid to spend so much money on all these little details and then, you know, be completely relaxed about COVID, right? So that's a bit my fear that, you know, this is going around and that uh, that it's this is not the f this is not the last guy that the race is going to lose because of COVID. It's also very hard to to even know what effects COVID is having on these riders right now, because, you know, it's, and it's a delicate subject, I know, but those, you know, in 2020, when people were getting sick, they were getting very sick and you, you wouldn't have felt like riding a bike. You know, these guys, some of them may not even know they had it if it were not for the test. It's I mean, changed. Yeah. we have probably had it a few more times than we even know, right? Uh, so it's difficult to even 
gauge how much it would pull them out, like I affect do, their performance. I do want, like, let's say he never takes the test. He never tests positive because he doesn't take it. He's just sick. Like this is a punishing Giro. I mean, these stages are cold. They're wet. They're all over 200K. The pace has been hard. I mean, if this was a tour and you could roll along for four or five sprint stages, maybe, but I just have a hard time believing with it, with a viral infection of, of any significance that you could realistically hang in the race. And as Johan was saying in the pre-show, his face yesterday after the stage was, was beat up. I mean, you could see how much he was suffering just from his face. So I don't know if he could have, I, I, at first I thought, well, this is a little odd. Like maybe just isolate him for the rest day, see how he feels Tuesday morning. Maybe he can get through that stage, but you know, with a little bit more time to think about it, you know, they probably just thought you have COVID. Like, what are we doing? You're already sick. You, you'll probably, you're not going to win this race if you have a viral infection against, you know, you only had a 45 second lead, which is not as much as you would have expected after two flat time trials. I just think it, I don't think it was like really an option they had to keep him in the race. It was a 30 second lead uh, after the, the, the time that he lost. After the time he lost, then oh no no no, it was again back to yeah yeah true 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 it was again back to forty five, but but um, Spencer, you know after the time trial, so before he took the test, so he didn't know yet that he had COVID, he was already complaining about you know my nose is blocked, you know it, I'm I'm not feeling great, I hope I can recover, you know with the rest day, so he was complaining about certain symptoms. And, and, you know, my, my personal opinion is that right now, I mean, in the majority of the cases of COVID, of course, there are still cases where the symptoms are severe. Um, but, you know, I mean, almost everybody is vaccinated. Uh, in, in the case, they are not, they have built up enough antibodies. And let's say the symptoms are milder, but it's still comparable to a flu. And you know what? I mean, if it's not COVID and you have the flu, you go home too. In, yeah. In the gym, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's, it's that there's nothing that can go wrong. You know I mean? Okay. You can have a cold. Okay. And you can, you can try to, uh, to get, you know, to get through a few stages and you can get better from a cold, but not from the flu. I mean, the flu, it, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's complicated. And, um, I'm sure, you know, there's, there's, I've seen a lot of, uh, comments on social media that, yeah, you know, this is, he saw that he was fading and that he wasn't going to win. So they took that as an excuse. I, I call bullshit on that. Uh, I think it's, I think it's, you know, listen, at the end of the day, they are, they have their medical team. They have, to, they did the tests. He tests positive. Uh, he, he, he must not feel great. So that's it. You know I mean? I, I have a, a hard time believing that a team like the dog quick step having put all these efforts since November uh, in this preparation of the Giro, which was his main objective of the year with, you know, all the riders around who had the same program, they went to Alto de, you know, even a pool, I think before he has Baston Liege, he had spent five days at home since the season started, wow. you know, uh, you don't throw that away. Like, you know, uh, like that, there must be a serious reason and, I think, I think, uh, those suspicions or, you know, whatever you want to call it, conspiracy theories that, <laughs> that he just went home because he saw that he couldn't win. I, I that's not true. Absolutely not true. Well, I think uh, it's good that Johan's pulling, pouring cold water in this. I will, I'm not proud of this thought. My first thought was, <laughs> oh, he got a start. He got an appearance fee from the Giro from RCS. And he always, he was just going to do the tour. That was always the plan. <laughs> and he just dropped out <laughs> and now he's going to collect a few million euros and then go to the tour anyway. But so I didn't, that was, on. that was my twisted thought too. Not oh. that he got paid already, but I, I thought, oh man, he's, he's on form. He realizes he can, he's tour ready. Let's go home, prepare for that. <laughs> no, you guys are, no. Yes, <laughs> it's late at night, yo. <laughs> spending too much time on social media and, and reading too much. Too many, you know, whatever you call it, you know, investigation, you know, c CSI. <laughs> We're like those guys that get on the, you know, the, the, uh, WebMD 
Oh, science. Yeah. I think we're a doctor, right? <laughs> There's a direct correlation between time on Twitter and how dumb you become. <laughs> All right, let's stay focused on uh, Remco for the time being. I think at a certain point, we're going to talk about those who remain. And it's really going to be interesting with Garen Thomas and Theo Gegenhardt and Roglic. So let's hold off on that for a mo the moment. What do you suspect? And I know there's no way to know for sure. What do you think the, the rest of the season looks like for Remco? How do they shape this up? I'm assuming I'll have a speedy recovery. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, it, listen, I, I don't know. I don't know. Personally, the way everything is structured now and the way the seasons are set up, I think, I mean, I may complete, be completely wrong. I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, I think his next focus was going to be the world championships and he's going to remain with that plan because the tour, listen, right now, especially in the case of a guy like Remco Evenepoel, he's world champion. He's one of the biggest talents. Whenever he shows up, he, it's people expect him to win. First, the first person who expects him to win is himself. He expects to win. So yeah, if I you look at if you look online at what they had disclosed, I mean, yeah, it's world championships for road and time trial in Lombardia and one other yeah. tune-up race before those. But yeah, and and Lie Liege, it was Liege Baston Liege, the Giro, and then the worlds and uh, yeah, the world the world's road race and time trial. And so. Um, Knowing what goes into this, this is not just preparing for a race. It's a whole project. It's not just one person. It's a whole team, right? So I think it I mean, it's possible, but uh, I think it would really have to come from Evan Apul himself, who says, "You know what? I absolutely now want to. I'm so pissed off that this happened. I want to put things straight and you know uh, go to the tour." I can't see it happening. I think uh, Evan Apul is a guy. He's very methodical. And whenever he wants to go for uh, an objective, he will want to prepare perfectly for it. And uh, it's not just that you could say, oh, he only did nine days of racing in the Giro, but you know, all the work he did before is, of course, his, there's a lot of that condition that still will remain, you know, even if it goes down a little bit now because of his illness, he would be able to start uh, some kind of a preparation towards the tour, but... I, I just don't think I just don't think that that's going to happen. Um, it's the whole mentality shift. Uh, you need to turn the whole team around again. Uh, and Evenepoel is not a guy who can say, "Okay, you know, I'm going to go to the tour. Just throw me in there, take one guy out of the tour." Because let's not forget, the guys of Sudok Quickstep that are foreseen for the tour, they're also preparing right now, right, with other objectives. Because I don't know, they're probably going to take a sprinter, probably Jakobsen. And 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 Ala Philippe, right? Yeah, it's true. Ala Philippe is not Lefebvre's best friend anymore, or I mean, or, or at least you know they're they're not in love anymore with each other. <laughs> uh, and uh, I I don't I don't see it happening. I think I think he's going to stay on on schedule for his next objectives. And repeating a world championship would just be massive. I would just no, I wanna... <laughs> if there's anything if there's anything else to change, I think it would make a lot more sense for him to do the Vuelta again. Because not that he he has time to prepare for that. And after the Vuelta, he can definitely go straight to the world. Oh, but just one if it's a really weird year where the world championships is now right after the tour, and I think it's you know, it's like two weeks before the start of the Vuelta. That's so that true. would that's make it a little hard. True. Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, yeah. Okay. Well, then, yeah, I, I think I, I think we have the answer there. I think he's preparing full gas for the World Championships. Is that, I, I still have a hard time believing Sudal Quickstep is just going to be like, yeah, we're sending this cute little team to the tour. Oh, no, we didn't get a stage win. And you just have Renko Evenepoel sitting at home. <laughs> it seems a little... Ridiculous, but let's say he does win the world championships. We are really off topic now, but let's say he wins the world championships. And is that kind of an odd season? Like he wins Liège, looks great. Does nine days of a grand tour, wins the worlds, and that's the season? Hey, I, I would have taken that any time. <laughs> Just winning he has left on Liège and not having any more results in the rest of the year, I'll take it. <laughs> Yeah, but ninety percent of the peloton will take it. Listen, Spencer. Let's not forget also one thing, right? So, 
One thing is the team and the sponsors, but let's not forget that Patrick Lefebvre has all of his sponsors signed up for, until 2026. So, you know, it's, it's, they're fine. They're fine. I mean, they're not going to be judged on, I mean, this is obviously, you know, a big setback, but that's part of the sport, right? I mean, listen, it's, uh, nothing's guaranteed. I mean, but, uh, he's out with COVID now. What if he crashes uh, and, and, you know, he crashes out. That's the same thing. So, uh, no, I don't think there's going to be any pressure of the sponsors uh, to for him to do the tour. The pressure is from the the, the media and and the fans. It. I mean, I, yes, I agree. Everyone would love that. He is really at a level though where he's should be being compared to Pogacar and Vinegard. And if I, I don't know. It's, it feels odd to me. Obviously, I'm not a stakeholder. But Lefebvre, what's his favorite thing to say? He'll say this to anyone. He's saying it to a mailman right now. I don't pay these guys to win world championships. I don't care about world championships. They don't ride for my team in the world championships. Is that going to play point. into that at all? Hey, is there any jersey that's, that has more exposure than the world championships jersey throughout the year with your sponsors on it? Especially when you show up in white. You know, no. <laughs> the favorite, the favorite knows the value of, of a world championship jersey, uh, for sure. I think he had like eight or nine already in the history of his team. So he, he knows they're a plague on his team. He can't, he can't stand them. <laughs> it hides the sponsors. Again, let's hold off. Let's hold off on getting, uh, into what we think is going to shake out for the rest of the Giro, uh, especially with Roglic, Garen Thomas, Gegenhart. We'll get into that. But let's touch on some of the stages that we have not talked about since our last visit. Stage seven with a breakaway that stayed. Uh, let's give us some of your your thoughts on on that. Mm -hmm. You want to go first, Spencer? Yeah, yeah, I need to issue a formal apology to everyone listening to this. I said the last episode, yeah, this is going to be a good stage. Make sure you watch this one. <laughs> it might have been the most boring stage I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it was interesting scenery, but that breakaway went. And once it was gone, it was gone. They didn't really try to pull it back. Pretty cool, like, trio. Because neither of them had ever had a professional win before. So that was interesting. And then that was kind of it. The GC group didn't do anything. It was the, whole, the whole GC group just called a truce, basically. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, you know, it, we all knew that was a possibility because it was announced that uh, the last 13 kilometers, it was the first mountain top finish above 2,000 meters. And not extremely hard though, it was super long. And then the last eight kilometers were a little steeper, but an, an incredible strong headwind. So, you know, uh, it's already the first time in any, any Grand Tour that you have the mountain stage, no matter how these guys are prepared, no matter how much they know their numbers and how much watts they can put out. and. They're all nervous to see how they're going to respond, the, the GC guys, in the first mountain stage. That's still, you know, the doubt they have. So, you know, nobody really wanted to give it a try. The, 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 the stage was not, as, was not for grabs. You know, the, the breakaway was gone. Um, and so I, I, could, I can understand that uh, that was, you know, that was with that wind, it would be, it would be really stupid to try something a huge risk for maybe nothing um or, or at least just a little bit because if it's windy on a climb and it's not extremely steep then then you're always at disadvantage when you're in front so um what i what i do find uh interesting though i mean i don't i mean this it's not i mean it's it's a pure coincidence but so this was already the the, th the second stage that the breakaway made it to the finish Right. Uh, the other one was the the stage with Leknesund and and Pare Pantre. Uh That was stage four, I think. Um, and uh, it was the second time this season in any World Tour race that a breakaway made it to the finish. Also, so two times in the Giro, and uh, the second time in this Giro that a guy wins. Who has a brother in the same race? Mm. You know, Pare Pantre was uh, had has his brother. Well, I didn't know that. Oh. that. Yeah, there's two brothers. There's two Pare Pantres. Uh, I think it's I, I don't know. I don't know. One is Aurelien, and the other one uh, Valentin, 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 and Aurelien. And uh, and here the two the two Bice brothers are also on the same team uh, and in the same race. And and one of the brothers wins again. So those 
those room brother rooms the the atmosphere must have been amazing there um this guy is the youngest of the two brothers but uh first victory in the professionals what i mean as an italian winning a stage in the giro and also um amazing accomplishment for eolo cometa you know the team of uh, ivan basso and alberto contador they uh they are a team that's invited to the giro and for the second time in three years they win a big mountain stage that's i mean for a small team like them that's an amazing accomplishment and for sure super super happy sponsors and i mean he really his brother actually was in the breakaway the next day which is uh, how often does that happen two brothers in breakaway <laughs> breakaways on consecutive days but he i rewatched that final climb and he played it so smart like he did a, the, the least work possible Every, the, the other two riders were attacking 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 he would just sit on the wheel of the rider who had to should close it down and force them to close it down they get inside and as you said headwind so just just wait just sit there and wait he waited until 200 to go he did one move pretty much all day, and that was the winning move, and it was an impressive ride from him. Yeah, yeah, and the, and um, the guy who got second, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about him. So um, I forgot his first uh, first name now. Is it? Uh, it's, is it's Carl? Carl. Carl. Carl Vacek. So young rider on Team Koratek, uh, also a team that's invited, um, and. Um, Finished second, but was incredibly happy, uh, was kind of celebrating his second place. And and then when I heard the interview after the finish and, and looked up a little bit his story, uh, it was interesting to find out that, this, you know, he's the same age as, as Remco Evenepoel and was they were rivals in juniors. Um, there was one stage race where Karel Vacek beat Remco Evenepoel twice. He won a time trial and he won a mountain stage. And apparently, uh, when he was, so he was, he must have been 18 then, uh, in juniors, he made some uh, comments, uh, as you do when you're 18 and you feel on top of the world. And, you know, uh, he said, hey, you know, now we've seen who is the best climber of this generation, which, mm -hmm. you know, racing against even a pool, that's not very smart, uh, common to say, because uh, I think he had those two wins, but he didn't do much else. But apparently, you know, that kind of turned the hit against him a bit. And he had a rough road towards, you know, the professionals. And then basically, you know, nobody believed in him anymore. And I heard his interview after the stage and he said, you know, this is amazing for me. I kept believing nobody believed in me anymore. Uh, but I kept believing that if I keep working, keep working, it's going to happen one day. And, and this for me tastes like a victory because you know this team Koratek trusted in me and we got invited to the Giro and I can now finish here second on this mountaintop finish and he kind of not direct but he kind of apologized a bit for what happened a few years ago he said you know and I hope that all the people who have been angry with me and criticized me that one day we, we can become good friends so obviously it was it was really nice to see, and the guy was super super happy. And uh, you know, it, not not everybody is Remco even a pool or Tadej Pogacar, and you know, they they need some more time. And at the end of the day, you know, needing more time is also very very relative, you know, because he's only twenty two. You know, normally that's when you're considered to be going to the pros. Or back in the days, that's now everybody is looking when they're eighteen or nineteen and they don't have a chance people give up, uh, but there are other examples of, of guys who, you know, are a little bit, uh, slower to, to get to the top. And, uh, this guy is still only 22. The other guy, Davide Baiz is 26 and he just won his first pro race ever. So there's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's obviously a, a sport where people get to the top uh, in different, in different ways. And, uh, I, I really like to see that a young talent, you know, who kind of was giving up hope and people had not believed in him, kept going and can can get there also, you know. That was nice to see. And the and the resources they have at their disposal from this level of team yeah. to what Remco has, right? Yeah. That's 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 a big jump. Um Okay, let's talk about stage eight because a lot happened there, obviously. Uh let's first start with the stage winner who 
has gotten a lot of TV time mm-hmm. in, in this year, this season already. Ben Healy, who's a writer that just has grown on me immediately. Like, uh, I really, I really like this talent. Well, and I have a to big I one for him. Say- I have to say, sorry, I sorry, I take the lead on this, Spencer. I have to say, <laughs> I raised my hand and I uh, I have to swallow my words. I don't remember in which uh, episode, but it's probably it was probably on the pre-show or, of the Giro or after the Baston Lege. I don't remember, but I did uh, I did say, uh, and I thought at that time, you know, that I had heard that Ben Healy would be going to the Giro, and and I said, big mistake from the team to take him to the Giro. I have to swallow that uh, and and uh, and say, hey, man, hats off to that performance. Uh, it was it was incredible. Um, I'm, I'm trying to re- reflect on why you said that. I think the context was, of it was, he was getting some results early. Yeah. And then it's like, it was as, as if the team was just gonna throw him at everything because exactly. they got a star, right? Yeah. Exactly. yeah. So, 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 you know, the guy is on form. Uh, I saw him win a stage in, in March in Coppi Bartali in a stage race in Italy. Then does these uh, incredible performances in the classics, you know, in, in both Amstel and in Liege. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's to me, it's it, it looked like, you know, okay, this is a young guy who's in incredible shape. So, okay, let's take him to the Giro, you know? Take him everywhere. I have to say, JB and Spencer, you know, and I want to be completely uh, straightforward with this. You know, EF, it's not it's not the riders. The manager of EF is not my favorite person, right? So I I, I can I can honestly say that I have my reasons for that. We're not going to go into detail because I would take uh, a couple of podcasts, um, but which we maybe will do over cocktails sometime. <laughs> Yeah, but um, but so uh, no. Hats off to that rider, a- amazing talent. Then when you go look back, uh, you know, and see, uh, you know, he's not been on the radar of people. But you know, he he won two years ago. He won a stage in the Baby Giro. He was on Trinity Racing, which is the same team as Tom Pitcock. Was on uh, on the same team as this other big talent that's on Jumbo Visma, the other uh, British guy, Thomas Bloch. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, who's who's also a big talent, and um, you know this guy is incredible. And to me, it seems like like Ben Healy is one of those young riders who he has everything figured out. I think uh, you know his his position on the bike. It may look like it's not very stylish. It's not, but if you look at it really from from a performance point of view. He is super aerodynamic. He has a position when he when he's on the hoods, on the brake levers. It's studied to be as fast as possible. And, and you know, I mean, and he knew, he knew when he was going with 50K to go, that was, in my opinion, the way I saw it, that was an acceleration with the intention, okay, I can maintain this and I'm going to the finish. And there was nobody in that breakaway who could even think about following him. All they could do is watch him right away. Impressive, really impressive performance. Um, you know, not not just the win, but the way he won. And and you know, he he uh he the 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 Peloton of the favorites did not take any time back. They only took a little bit of time in the final when Roglic attacked. A little bit, not much. So I mean amazing, amazing performance uh for for Ben Healy. Yeah. Bef- before you give your thoughts on Ben Healy, Spencer, I did look if this is accurate. What I'm looking at online, this he only had a two year contract with EF, and this is year two, so he could be a really hot commodity for next year. Agents fielding some calls for sure, <laughs> right? But your he thoughts? Went, yeah, I was gonna say he went so fast w- when he attacked with 50k to go. Johan and I thought that he was confused because it was a circuit. We thought he thought that was the finish. Like he was going unbelievably fast. Like, do you remember even just a few years ago, 50K solo breakaway? Like that would seem, oh, that's just not even worth doing. Don't even try it. And he pulled out such a gap and he didn't slow down. I was just like, this this race is over. Yeah. And on such a on such a hard circuit, Spencer, you know, he went on he went on that first climb. Was, uh, so there was this short, I mean short. And not short because it it put it put Evan pulled in trouble. Uh, you know, like three kilometers steep climb, cap, uh, cap, 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 I think it called. Yeah. Then there was a second category climb, which was about eight kilometers. 
then he had some flat, and then at the end he had that again. I mean, to to, and he did not slow down. I mean, that's that last time he went over that climb again, he went still really fast. Yeah, that's what was most impressive to me. That he just it wasn't an attack, and then oh, I'm hanging on. It's just I'm. I'm riding this fast. Yeah. Like he must have been laughing to himself the 50k before they got there. Like I am going to smoke these guys. My only concern is who who would ever work with him now? Like can he ever get in another breakaway? Like it, it was just a dom like a domination of a pretty strong breakaway group. Well, obviously, you know, if he goes in breakaways, it's going to be mountain stages. Yeah. So already there, you know, it's it's normally a bunch of climbers. Uh, but yeah, I mean, listen. Listen, he got a great victory, uh, not just because it's a stage in the Giro, but the way he won that stage, that's going to stick with people for a long time. You know, like, oh, that's that guy who did this amazing, uh, crazy performance in, in the Giro. You know, that's, that's, I mean, yeah, um, again, uh, I uh, obviously what I said was I was completely wrong, and it's you know once again the proof that you know cycling has changed a lot, and I really don't know shit about this game anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he just hadn't peaked yet. We thought he was like holding on to form. We didn't realize that he just wasn't even on form yet during the spring classics. <laughs> he kind of reminds me of Julian Alaphilippe, like uh, just uh, like he could win. Hilly one day races, he could win stages, but I'm actually not sure I've ever seen Ala Philippe rip off the front of a Grand Tour stage like that with 50k left to go yeah. and then win the stage. Oh, well, well, they both, they both, but I think Ben Healy even more than Ala Philippe. They both look a bit like D'Artagnan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know who D'Artagnan is? I think we say D'Artagnan or something. Oh, D'Artagnan? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, they both look. You know, like the the the, the longer hair, the yeah, the slash the little beard. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the other things we saw on uh, on uh, stage eight. We saw Roglic attack, and then uh, now we know a lot more about Remco not being able to answer. We I don't think we have to go too deep into that, but Garen Thomas and Teo Gegenhart right there. Um, so your thoughts on the GC battle that we saw there? Spencer, what do you think? Well, Teo looked, well, Roglic looks good. Like back to, uh, I think, <laughs> um, uh, uh, Brian Nygaard on the cycling podcast called it, he, he brought sexy back. He brought the old Roglic back. Like his cadence was was really impressive. Yeah. It looked like, oh, he's back. This is him. Um, I was really impressed that Gegenhart seemed not to even miss a beat. I, I thought Remco panicked a little. Like he, he maybe went too deep too quick. Gegenhardt didn't. He just kind of chugged right back up to him, caught him right at the top. That's exactly where you need to catch on a climb like that because you don't want any gap on the descent because it can be hard to catch back on. Thomas was a little bit slower. I'm curious to see how this plays out over the next two weeks. If Thomas, is he off the pace of a little bit of Gegenhardt and how does that affect the team? But I mean, Garrett Thomas is a tough, tough, tough guy. Like he was, what, two, two seconds off the back when they crested the top and it's hard to to nail someone back like that on the scent. And you could see Thomas just killing himself to get back on. Johan, question for you and for you, JB. Why didn't they work? Why were they a little hesitant to work with Roglic once they caught him? I didn't understand that. Me neither. Mm. Me neither. To, like, it, they should have been, like, we got to put time in Ramco. Let's this go. is Let's the go. chance. Yeah, this right. game yeah, and crushing yeah. us. Yeah. Oh, for, 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 for first of all, they were all on the limit, right? Especially, especially, I mean, no, listen, at that point, they're all on the limit. But, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I think Rain Thomas was definitely on the limit because he, he was the slowest guy to, 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 and it took, it took him a lot of effort to get back. So then you have like your, your heartbeat up here and you have to, but they could have started to, to, to work together earlier. Uh, it would have, you know, maybe have been another 10 seconds because it would have given Roglic some recovery. And, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what, you know, we'll, anyway, we don't have to see now because Ram goes out, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, listen, Spencer, I, I mean, you know, you know, I said from the beginning, right. That this was going to be uh, a four man race. It was going to be, it was going to be, uh, Remco and Roglic and Hagengard and, and, and Thomas. Did I? I didn't. I did. Right. 
I think oh, we did it. No, but we did it. No, we did. We, 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 we said, we said, hey, this is this is Remco versus Rock Nation. <laughs> no, we said about anybody else. Well, it could be a COVID case. And actually, <laughs> t- Garrett Thomas impressed me at Tour of the Alps. I think I said the opposite of that. He looked terrible at the exactly. Tour of the Alps. I don't know what happened. So, no, here you, that's you know that's that's the proof that these guys listen. We kn- we knew that Theo Gegenhardt was in good shape, but in my opinion, and I think most of most of the people and the followers of cycling say, okay, you know, it's it's Theo Gegenhardt. Yes, he won the Giro, but it's only the Tour of the Alps. The Giro is another another game, and uh, but in my opinion, from what I've seen now, Theo Gegenhardt is in better shape than in the Tour of the Alps right now. Not just because he he could get across to Roglic, but especially because of his time trial yesterday. I mean, that's the best time trial Theo Gegenhardt ever did in professional cycling. Well, do you want to hear a crazy stat? So out of the four main contenders, contenders, Theo Gegenhardt, Primoz Roglic, Schwalameda, Garrett Thomas, Theo Gegenhardt has beaten Thomas by 14 seconds in the combined time trials, Roglic by 18, Almeida by 22. So he's the best time trialist of these GC contenders remaining. And he's not even a time trial specialist, which tells you his form must be unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. So now they're all, and these, these are all within five seconds here. Garen Thomas, I mean, Roglic is just two seconds behind that. And Teo Gegenhardt is just three seconds behind Roglic. Yeah. So crazy. Dirty. Obviously, we knew Roglic has been smelling blood all along, especially with that attack then. But how does this shake out, in your opinion, you guys, between uh, Thomas and Gegenhardt? Well, wow. is, is it still kind of a cool co-leadership kind of thing, or do they? What do you think? I, I think I think they. First of all, I think they're good friends. I think they they. I mean, to me, it seems at least that's what we see on social media, right? I I I kind of like the vibe that's going on within Team Ineos. It's they they're you know they're joking, they're making fun, they they have. A, a special sense of humor, uh, but I kind of like it, and um, I don't think there's going to be any issue at all between between those two guys. Uh, they both will work for each other when they have to, and I think that's what that's the strength against Roglic and Jumbo Visma. That, you know, they have only they have only that card to play, and uh, it may be that that's how they can beat him. Um, on the other hand, you know. The Giro, whatever we've seen until now, is nothing compared to the incredible long and steep mountains that we still have ahead of us. So, um, you know, there's certain there's certain stages where the climbs, it doesn't really matter if you have somebody with you or not. It's like, okay, whoever can go up this thing fast, fastest is is winning because drafting is not such, such a big, big advantage. And, uh, you know... Now, the thing is, uh, what's going to happen is Ineos, because normally if Geraint Thomas decides tomorrow to to start in pink, he has the choice apparently, because he hasn't actually gotten it on the road. I personally think he should, he should start in pink. Um, but are they going to defend that jersey or going to, going to try to look for uh, a situation to kind of get rid of the jersey, but still stay ahead of Roglic? It changes a lot in the dynamics of, of, you know, how much they have to work and how much they have to control. Um, now, all of a sudden, they are in the favorite role. And uh, it's not anymore, you know, let's just get all our troops together and send people. Uh, it's clear it's clear that Gegenhardt and Thomas are the ones of the team who can match Roglic for the moment when it's uphill. And the others, uh, with all due respect, you know, Aronsman, Sivakov, uh, Laurence de Plus, they are they are in amazing shape, but they're not as good as as Roglic. So it's it's a bit of it's a bit of a it's a bit of a risk also, right? So for, let's let's say for example, there's a situation in one of the next stages, and the group goes, and Aronsman is in there, who still you know is a great cyclist, and uh, he seems to get into shape. I mean, a lot better shape than. And he was in Tour of the Alps. This is a, probably somebody who reacts to altitude a little bit later. Um, but is that worth the risk of letting a breakaway go and get Arnsman in that uh, leader's position? 
uh, and whoever is with that group, are they, is there not a risk that somebody may beat Arensman further down the road? Right. So, yeah. Hang on. But, uh, before you give your thoughts, Spencer, on this whole, whole how this is going to shake out, uh, real quick here, let's check in with Lance. He'll have uh, some messages and a couple offers. We always, almost always have discounted offers with our partners. And we'll be right back. Our next partner has a product that I literally use every day. I started taking Athletic Greens, gosh, been a couple years now. I really wanted better gut health, more energy, and I kind of hated taking pills and vitamins. I wanted a supplement that actually tastes great. So what is this stuff? 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day off just right, all for less than three bucks a day. It's really about taking control of your health. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. Let's make it easy. Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your free first purchase. All you got to do is head to athleticgreens.com slash the move. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash the move. Let's talk about HVMN. All right, we're talking about the company that has... Uh, that has really perfected this idea of ketones and ketone esters. Uh, this has also become a, a, real, a part of our daily uh, protocol, not just myself and George, but our friend J.B. Hager. He was laying around, thought he had, you know, COVID brain. HPMN and ketone IQ snapped him right out of it. Um, we often hear that fasting and exercise are good for the brain. There's so many other ways to do it. By the way, the, the ketone IQ has the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier, which is... Uh, is pretty unique um, and also uh, used by the special forces, uh, not just here in the United States, but around the world. And, and as well as we talk about all the time, 60% of the, uh, reportedly and upwards of 60% of the Peloton is using the ketone IQ from HVMN. Head on over to HVMN.com. Use the promo code THEMOVE at checkout. That saves you 20%. Again, that's HVMN.com and the promo code is THEMOVE. Let's talk about sleep. More specifically, let's talk about Helix Sleep. As you all know, so, so many of y'all listeners out there are pushing yourself hard, whether it's on the bike or on the running trail or in the pool or in the gym. And sleep is one. That's the best hack I've ever come up with. And fortunately, my entire life, I've been a good sleeper. But guess what? It's gotten a lot better because I only sleep on a Helix mattress. Here's a question for you. How long have you had your mattress? How has your sleep improved? Well, now we have an answer to it. With Helix, you go on their website, take a two-minute sleep quiz, talk about your sleep, talk about the characteristics of what you like and what you don't like, what you'd like to improve, and voila, you have a totally custom mattress shipped directly to you. And by the way, don't forget the little ones. Helix Sleep has kids' mattresses specifically designed for children 3 to 12 years old. Check this out as well. Parents Magazine just named it the best mattress winner for their little ones out there. And also Wired Magazine and GQ Magazine named Helix Sleep one of the best mattresses on the market. Helix Sleep is offering up to 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash the move. Again, that's helixsleep.com slash the move. Okay, Spencer, now, now your thoughts uh, on this, especially with uh, Ineos. Yeah, Johan brings up an interesting point here where they could have time and Arnsman get into a breakaway. They call everybody's bluff like, well, we're not worried about it because we have five riders. They have five riders out of their seven in the top 13 within two and a half minutes of the race lead. And all of them are pretty good climbers. So it gives you a few cards to play. If you want to be aggressive, yeah, you could say, well, Arnsman, we're fine with losing the jersey. Now he's the leader. Um, but yeah. This is this is a problem they've had for like five years now since Chris Froome had his crash. They have a, a wealth of options. They even this happened a little bit in 2019 at the tour when Bernal and Thomas were both up there and they seemed like they were hesitant to pick a leader. You you can have the race slip away. Like what if they okay, Arnsman's in pink, Arnsman gets dropped and crushed on the stage 20 time trial, and now we've lost the race. Maybe we just should have picked one rider to back them, like Yumbo is doing with Roglic. It's, you know, it. I just kind of wonder, are, are we going to see this again where they almost ride too conservatively to cluster riders towards the top and they aren't okay with just saying, Garrett Thomas, you're our leader. Taylor Gagenhart, you're our leader. 
Obviously, I think that would be too reactive because those guys, correct me if I'm wrong, should be co-leaders. I don't think Gegenhardt's going to be working for Thomas at any point. I don't think, unless he falls out of contention, I don't think if Thomas gets dropped, Gegenhardt is going to wait for him in the middle of a stage, a mountain stage. I think those guys are co-leaders. Gegenhardt's actually outperformed Thomas on the road. The only reason he's behind him is he lost 19 seconds in a sprint stage because he was held up by a crash. So Gegenhardt should be considered within the team is equal, if not even a more priority than Garrett Thomas, because he's actually won a Grand Tour more recently than Garrett Thomas has. Um, but it, it remains to be seen to me. Actually, I think it's a bit of a pain in the butt for them that Rev- Evanipole left because Quickstep would have controlled the race for the next week. That's actually a pretty tricky week. And now they have to burn all these guys in the front. And they have Crowns Montana coming up on Friday, which is a really hard mountain stage. They might have preferred just to have been sitting back and letting Quick Step control this race. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll we'll see. We'll see. I mean, now obviously Ineos is the the you know the team that everybody's going to be looking at. Um, so it depends. I I could foresee. In the next few stages, uh, getting a new an, another pink jersey uh, uh, rider, um, so that Ineos can kind of sit back a little bit and don't, doesn't have to do all the work. Would that be? I'm just looking. We're we're getting to the point where that starts to get difficult. Like I know. playing our Rubio or someone, like give them eight minutes, <laughs> and then I don't know. Like it's. I think it's going to be hard for a break to get to the line with enough time, especially with sprinters knowing that the the chances or the opportunities are, are running out really fast. And if you look, I mean, everyone within, let's say three minutes, I would be a little worried about getting leadership too. Maybe, you know, maybe trying to give it back to Le- Lechnusen, that, who's yeah. now about a minute back. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm Lechnusen, man, I am all over these breakaways. Uh, Me too. You know, easier said than done, of course, because... Uh, uh, the guy fought like a lion to, you know, to maintain his lead in, on stage eight. And then even in the time trial, he went super, super hard. But uh, yeah, if you look at all the other riders, it is, it becomes a bit of a, it's not easy. Yeah. Like you don't want to spot Jay Vine anytime because that guy can time trial. So you get to the stage 20 time trial, you've given Vine too much time. You could find yourself in trouble really fast. Yeah. I mean that's a, that's a climbing stage, uh, Spencer. That different. But he's a climber and a time trialist. <laughs> he is more of a climber than a time trialist. Yeah, yeah um, it's it's it, now that I look at now that I look at the GC here, it's it's not going to be easy to give that jersey away. So, yeah, I mean, you know, you may you may as well keep it then, right? <laughs> and they are strong enough. I mean, they would be nice if they had Ghana. I'm sure they wish he was still here and didn't yeah. have to. Re- leave the race with COVID, he would have been huge for them. You know, they are, they have kind of been controlling the race. They're the strongest team in the race. You know, maybe they just take this in stride and it's not that big of a deal. And they figure, at least in their minds, we would have had it on Friday anyway, because Gegenhardt's going to drop everybody and win that stage. (laughs) (laughs) Even if that maybe isn't exactly what what would have happened. Yeah. Uh, How, we'll go back to what you and brought up uh, earlier, Johan, you said when, you know, pre-show, we were like, Evan Poole and Roglic were way up here, and then we'll see who gets third on the podium. There was a big gap. How much has your opinion changed on that when you look at these three riders? No. I mean, right now, Greg and Thomas and, and Theo Gegenhardt, they are up there. They're level with, I mean, they're ahead of Roglic, so obviously it's because they're good, right? Um. And then, and, you know, it's it's just a question of the, the other guy. I mean, you know, Almeida's not far. Uh, Vlasov is, I mean, that's, then I think that, then there's already a little bit of a of a gap, you know, like Vlasov. But apparently I read an interview of Vlasov and he said that he, you know, he prepared only for the Giro, took it like, uh, like he would come a little, a little, I'm not going to say underperforming, but like taking it relatively easy and then try to be strong in the last week. So, um. You know, I, I can't see it happening that Blossov would beat everybody, but, uh, you know, let's not forget, you know, Thomas and Gegenhardt, they are Grand Tour winners. Uh, and, and you know, Thomas, even the Tour de France, the Tour de France was second in the Tour, was third in the Tour. Gegenhardt won the Giro. I mean, they're up there with 
with Rock Race. So, um, uh, you know, if you look at it now in hindsight, it's it's kind of a bit a bit logical. Although, you know, we have not seen. I've personally, the one who has impressed me the most and surprised me the most is Geraint Thomas, because I think uh, the way he's riding now, I, I don't think. I mean, he was third in the Tour de France last year. And in my opinion, he's better now than, than, than he was at that level last year in the tour. Um, so, I mean, it's difficult to compare the, the, the Giro and the tour, of course, but he is, he looks strong. He looks tough, obviously has experience, uh, most of everybody, um, you know, he's a diesel, so he's, he's not going to crack. I think that, uh, yeah, Thomas is probably going to be the biggest, the biggest rival for, for Roglic. You guys keep talking about the strength of Ineos and all this depth and how many of them are in the top 15 or whatever you said. What is your, after stage nine, what is your current evaluation of the strength of support for Roglic? Mm-hmm. You got, you got Sepp Kuss out there trying to put his hands in the spokes. Oh my God. <laughs> that was hard to watch. <laughs> not, not a great endorsement of Shram, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I've only seen one rider in, in real person with gorilla arms like that, just a derailleur. But you've probably seen a lot of it, Johan. But anyhow, what's the what? What is your grade of, of jumbo for support for Roglic going forward? You know, they, they don't have the same they don't have the same depth. But there was this one guy. I don't know now. Is in 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 stage eight? I don't know if that was. It was one of those young riders, uh, either the the British guy Thomas Glock or this other guy uh, Michael Hess, I think. Um, the German guy who is first year professional was on the development team last year. One of those two riders was impressive on uh, on stage eight, setting setting a, a tempo for for Roglic. Um, they have Sepp Kuss, they have Sam Ullmann, they have Kun Baumann. I mean, they, they have a strong team in the case that Roglic would get the pink. Uh, as long as he's not in pink, if, you know, it, it's fine for Roglic. You know, if he has one or two guys with him to keep him close whenever it matters to those, uh, to those other rivals, it's fine. Um, it's only when you get in the lead that you really need a solid team and... and um, I think they're not as strong as the Ineos, but I, I think they're strong enough. If in the case Roglic would would get in the lead, they could defend it. Well, I think their strength is that they're so focused on one thing. I mean, as Yo- it, Yohan said, it's not scrubs. Like th- these are good riders. They they don't have the depth of Ineos, but they have one goal. It's just a very simple plan every day when they wake up. To me, that is a massive advantage versus Ineos, which is, I know Gegenhard and Thomas are friendly, but that almost even makes it more complicated where you're both trying to help each other. To me, that just gets messy really fast. Like, I like this single, everything's in one basket. Let's go. Let's win this fucking race. Like, we just have one thing to do. I think it's a huge advantage. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, in 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 the case of Ineos, you know, even if they have uh, uh, one, two, three, four, so they have five riders in the top 14, but it's only really about two riders, right? It's about Gegenhard and, and Thomas. Uh, Sivakov and Ardensmann and the Plus are going to have to forget about their personal ambitions and, and be at the surface of those two. So, um, I mean, I'm, I don't, I, I don't dislike the situation of Ineos, you know, I mean, it's, it's good. It's a good situation to have. To have these two guys up there, and you know, in case something happens, you have you have another one, right? Uh, it's it's a lot more simple with one leader, um, but at the same time, you know, look look at look at uh, Sudal Quickstep. You know, these seven guys now they have to completely, yeah, that's the turn the switch, turn the switch, and and. And try to to get you know it's it's we only have nine days there's still eleven days twelve days to go twelve stages to go so it's gonna be tough for them but I, I can see them get away with a stage win or two uh, to that quick step but, well it's uh, gonna totally because they've been closing a lot of stuff down like McNulty's not been able to get into a breakaway because yeah. it up quick step marks him 
now they've switched sides. Now they're the ones attacking. I think it's going to make the race a little bit more unpredictable. These breakaways might have more firepower than they did before. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we covered everything. Any other, any other parting thoughts? Just one question. And so, Johan, you said earlier, you know, what we've seen these climbs are nothing to what we'll, we'll see later in the race. Are we potentially, like Garrett Thomas is time trialing well. Are, are we potentially just misremembering how good Primoz Roglic is? Like if you remember at Catalonia, anytime he, he got out of the saddle, he dropped everyone in that race, which a lot of them are GC contenders here at this Euro. Like, are we going to remember on Friday? Oh yeah, this guy's really, really good. I think so. I think, I think Roglic is, is an amazing cyclist. Um, you know, I'm I, again. You know, I'm 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 surprised to see that Thomas and and Gegenhardt are so close to him. I mean, he, as I said, he, even better for the moment. But let's not forget. You know, there are hard stages coming, and Roglic is a killer, and he, man, he's a specialist and at, at taking those bonifications. Um, you know, as you said before, you know, the Giro's never won with a big margin. The bonifications may be important. Uh, in this case, it's a huge advantage for Ineos also that Theo Gegenhardt is fast too. You know, so if Rockley doesn't drop Theo, then that's going to be interesting, those sprints for the, for the bonifications. That's true. That's true. I, I do. In this time, the time trial was crazy. Evan Apol wins. Thomas is a second back. Gegenhardt's two seconds back. Stefan Kung's four seconds back. Bruno Amaral, yeah. eight seconds back. Roglic, 17 seconds back. I've never seen margins that tight in a time trial of that length. In Roglic, I, to me, that's a little bit of not a fake result because you get the result you got. That was the race. But he went out so slow, like unbelievably slow. The, from the first time check to the finish, he smoked. He went second. Other, he was second fastest. He was second fastest from point one to the finish of the last uh, twenty-two kilometers. And the only one who beat him is Bruno, who had slightly better wind. Almiral, so, yes. Yeah. So he was, he is flying right now. So Rog, let's say Roglic, Roglic, and Theo Gegenhardt and Grain Thomas were were more or less uh on par so uh Roglic was two seconds faster than Gegenhardt in the in this in the second time in the second part and he was four seconds faster than Thomas that's basically the same he was however 14 uh, 15 seconds faster than Evenepoel in in that from point one to point to, to the finish um so and I I definitely saw a different Roglic on a time trial bike than on than in than on day one the cadence was completely different. Um, I don't know if 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 that was on purpose on 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 day one, uh, having a a lower cadence because it finished on a climb. I don't know what the thinking would be behind that, but uh, I think that time trial of Roglic was you know he didn't win, but uh, when he heard that he was he was behind uh, Evenepoel, he 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 went he started going. I can also see that Roglic is wants to start time trials patiently because we've seen him in the past just si looking sideways, helmet on the side of his head, and slobbering at the end of a time trial. I'm just so thinking. He, I'm just thinking um, <laughs> while you are saying this, JB, I'm just thinking now. I'm just you're just thinking. Hey, this Giro on the second last day finishes with a, a time trial, which is first flat and then with it climb. Almost exactly the same. When did that happen? <laughs> yeah. When did that? Anyway, the, the, you know, Pogaccia is not here and, and mm -hmm. there's, there's nobody of that level here, but, uh, but yeah, listen, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a shame. It's a shame that Evan Apool is, is, is gone, but it's, I mean, it, it's definitely going to be a very interesting Giro to, you know, and these guys are, yeah, we're talking about the three big guys and they're th all three Grand Tour winners, you know. It's uh, it's going to be an interesting race. Excellent. Okay, on that note, we'll wrap this up. I do want to take a second to uh, mention to people, you can go to wedo.team and get a season pass. You can be part of our member meeting, which is all the pre-show and uh, the fireworks from Johan. <laughs> it's good stuff, I'm telling you. And you never know what's going to come out of Lance's mouth on some of these pre-shows too. So you get that with your season pass. You'll get a member tee uh, when you sign up. 
you'll get discounts on all the merch. And also, if you um, uh, can help us out with our efforts in Teleco Plains, Tennessee. After I left Chattanooga at Hincapi Fondo, I went up to Teleco Plains with Operation Get Out. And it's a very impoverished community. But I will tell you this, it's some of the most beautiful terrain I've ever seen in my life. You know, a lot of people live in poverty there because uh, uh, it used to be lumber and iron works. That was where every, what everybody did there. And those industries no longer exist there. But people come into this area, Teleco Plains, for the day with their bicycles, with their motorcycles, hiking, and they, they leave for the day because the community just doesn't have all the, the hotels and infrastructure and Airbnbs, and bike shops and all that. But it could become a big cycling destination, in my opinion. Uh, so anyhow, if you can donate, we're, we're already, when I was there, they had already built, I don't know, maybe a hundred of the bicycles that these kids are going to get. $250 takes care of a kid getting on a bike for the first time taking care of with a helmet and, uh, and the people, the boots on the ground, there are great. They're going to get these kids out with some, some training, some rides, definitely getting them engaged in the sport. So again, if you can donate to that, we would sure appreciate it. You can go to we do.team. And, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a little more excited with what lies ahead on this Giro. Uh, now that Remco's out of the picture, it sucks. It went down this way, but it could get really interesting. And so we'll be checking in. Let's see. What's our next check-in here? Um, maybe Thursday? It's yeah, up to you guys. Probably Thursday, yeah. yeah probably yeah. Thursday. Okay. All right. So until then, uh, thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Johan. And we will talk soon.